<laughs> so, uh, yeah, by way of, of quick intro, so uh, to anyone that doesn't know me, I'm, I'm Sam Shaher, I'm the analytics client talent guy here at Austin Fraser. Um, we, we've we got this AI community group, which we founded with, uh, with, with uh, the likes of Stylianos, Jerry, who many of you will know, uh, and supported by the, the brilliant MKAI and Richard Foster Fletcher. So, uh, yeah, thanks for all for coming along. Um, the, this community is all to kind of help you know, both current and aspiring data science analytics leaders. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're really open to, to getting ideas from all of you and, and trying to provide you the content that, you know, that you're interested in seeing. Uh, but yeah, uh, just enough on, on that for now. I'll hand over to Stylianos, um, who is head of data science and products and scoring at CDP uh, in London, um, uh, just to talk a little bit about what we're, what we're all doing here, and then we'll, we'll go straight into, uh, into the keynote. I will try to uh, keep it quite short. Um, and I would like to say that I have, as a data scientist, found technical material uh, all over the place. There are so many communities that Stack Overflow helps us so much on a day to day. And there are libraries that come out every other day to the extent that I feel that I'm getting really old. Um, but I didn't find much when I was doing the transition between the actual day to day job of a data scientist through to the leadership. And it's a very, very big domain that is evolving fast. And there are a lot of things that new leaders need to learn. So we thought that through this community, we would provide some good learning points around more uh, of the issues that you might face as a leader, both on management, but also on ethics and the things that need to happen. And we'll have these uh, kind of style that we have already tried. We are supported by MKI, which is a huge brand in this space. So thank you very much, Richard, for all your help. And we're hoping that everyone here will take by you out of this event. Nice. So with, without any further ado, should we bring in Jerry for, uh, to introduce our keynote speaker? Hi. So ladies and gentlemen, our assembled and poised cream of global panelists Without doubt, the best, ever, the best event host and moderator on Spaceship Earth, distinguished guests, MKAI family members, friends, fellow philosophers, logicians, and sophists who, like me, think they might be here, it's my absolute pleasure and privilege to introduce our keynote. I won't read you his entire outline bio, as that could take longer than the time we've allotted for this event. During his career, he has directed teams of 500 plus employees in both government agency and Fortune 500 environments. He's advised on digital ecology, emerging communications infrastructure and global change for the United Nations. He founded the Human Sustainability Institute in 2000, following a distinguished career as a strategy and systems design consultant originating out of AT and T Bell Laboratories. He's an analytical outcome focused and visionary leader with extensive experience as an integral system solutions architect, forming and implementing strategic plans and initiatives that support sustainability and regeneration and innovation, culture development and community. He has a unique cross-disciplinary background comprised of harvesting executive leadership, innovation, project management, emerging technology, physics and human factors to develop revolutionary business, ecological, economic and social systems He's an international consultant and advisor to government. He works to manifest and implement lighthouse projects that guide and catalyze systemic change toward the concept of the new sphere, the highest level of biospheric design in harmony with natural life support systems and human potential. He has the ability to translate abstract or complex topics into clear and relatable subjects and is an expert in navigating the collaborative generation of viable solutions. Sit back, relax, and prepare for a bacchanalian feast of food for thought, an overdose of intellectual nourishment. Please welcome, live from Mexico, the truly incredible, extraordinary, fascinating, visionary, and brilliant Paul Quasia. Well, thank you, everyone. That uh, actually is intimidating to hear that about myself. It's like, uh, I better do some uh, some good work and produce some uh, uh, radical results. 
um, which is really my focus. Um, it might be best I will start to share my screen um, and we'll jump right into it. I, you know, I guess first off, uh, I'd like to just uh, authentically share, I do not consider myself a, a keynote speaker. Um, however, the it, it's really more of a call to action. So um, as I share this information, um, it's really a, a, a request to, uh, that would be the local chihuahuas, um, the, uh, to share a concept with you and really as an inquiry for how we can accelerate um, progression uh, for the concept. So uh, without further ado, I will jump right into it. Can everyone see the screen okay? We're good. So, uh, I guess what I'll do is I'll start with, with a little bit of history. Okay. Um, if you think back to the communications uh, industry, um, one of the first things that we needed to do was translate uh, human sensory information uh, through some type of synthetic network. Um, so we started with voice. So we had to have the ability to translate uh, voice energy and information. Um, uh, port that through some type of medium and then have it received on the other end um, audibly so the person can interpret that. That really, uh, that continuation of uh, extension of human neurology and sensory information is really at the core uh, of my work. Um, when we think about AI, most of the concepts around AI uh, involves this separate entity. Um, that's not connected to humans, but operating autonomously. Um, I view artificial intelligence and, and machine learning more as an augmentation to human uh, sensory and neurological uh, types of connections. Um, so as an example, um, most of us have access to uh, digital devices, our phones. Um, which is kind of interesting. It's still referred to as, as a phone uh, predominantly. But the, uh, one of the things that the phone can do or perform for us is we no longer have to memorize people's telephone numbers. We can just uh, refer to them by some type of other uh, memory orientation, like call Richard or call Sam. And it will translate my uh, recollection and reference uh, to some other extended memory device. Um, and that's really the core of, of my work. Um, that is just kind of a summary of the journey that I've taken. Um, it really originated around, uh, I would say from my mother's influence really more of a spiritual orientation and an extension into other phases of communication and or reality. Um, and then on my father's side is more of a, a technical mechanical uh, orientation. And then it got involved with biology when he uh, became ill and ultimately passed away from cancer uh, when I was around 15 years old, which really was a, a launch into uh, my journey. The objective of my work is to enable uh, human, uh, human murmuration. And I use murmuration and metamorphosis as the framework frequently uh, for the work that I'm doing. Murmuration is really collective intelligence. How can we form a bridge between separate entities um, to where it is, uh, kind of accumulates into a collective intelligence. The, uh, the other piece of murmuration is that collective intelligence begins to move in a particular direction in a unified manner, which is an absolute essential component to what we need to do for the future. We can you know, simplify that concept into a collaboration, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Uh, a colleague of mine, in the Netherlands um, has, well, let me back up. Um, 
humanity has become toxic to our environment. We have formed all kinds of pollution um, in the air, in the water, in the soil. Um, it really started out with, uh, you know, don't pollute. So people would pick up their trash. Uh, then it evolved and it still exists today into recycling. And I was actually gonna start with a, a sarcastic joke around recycling, um, you know, in the nature of British humor uh, kind of thing. But um, in, the, in the interest of time, I, I didn't do that. The reality of the matter is we've been entrained as a society that recycling works. Um, but in the United States specifically, the, the, the figures really are that we are only recycling between four and 6% of everything that's collected. So we have you know, the community at large trying to do their best um, in the interest of the environment and, and uh, trying to contribute to uh, cleaning it up. And yet the system is a sham. Um, you know, most of it ends up in a landfill and then it ultimately ends up in our uh, soil and then in our food and our water. Uh, and it's definitely in our air and, uh, and in the oceans now. Um, so, and now the most recent topic is CO2 emissions that are going into our atmosphere that are causing other types of uh, biological changes in the biosphere. Um, so uh, a colleague of mine from the Netherlands has put together a, kind of a brief introduction and he's in the process of developing a, a documentary along the lines of this topic and uh, it's called Humanification and I thought it would be ideal to share that with all of you. I think, uh, you know, the this kind of awareness of um, using technology and engineering it from a biomimicry standpoint uh, is quite profound. Um, unfortunately, most of the topics around uh, advanced technology is completely artificial um, versus uh, an integration or a symbiosis of, of technology and, uh, and humanity. Um, so the essence of my focus now is a completely different process using advanced technology to for design purposes, analysis and design. And I've been referring to the um, kind of the consolidation of that uh, technology and process as the Atlas Biospheric Design Center. And what that center will do and perform is it will collect and analyze global climate data and integrate that with local, social, cultural, and physical data. And from that uh, uh, data informatics or information um, uh, illustration, um, we can specifically design communities uh, in a kind of a synthesized and harmonized manner so where it's in balance with nature. So that's the objective. The Synthelect hypothesis is really utilizing or accessing um, technology as a medium to for expanded states of consciousness. Um, the, the example I gave earlier was 
we all are already accessing the network or the synthetic um, neurology uh, as a means for memory. So we use it for memory and artificial intelligence is really a process, the cognitive processing component of that or mach machine learning. We're teaching um, the, the computers to uh, do analytical processing or cognitive processing. And then that can function as an extension. For example, we can ask uh, a navigational app to say, I need to get from here to there. So, um, and it will chart out different alternatives, whether you're walking, whether you're driving, um, whether you're flying, uh, the best route. Can we enhance that capability by saying this is the most ecologically friendly way to get from point A to point B. Um, so the, this is the kind of uh, cognitive processing um, that I reference. So there have been two, I guess, fundamental approaches to addressing now our, our greatest challenge, which is uh, the Anthropocene or the human effect on our biosphere or our life support system uh, within this uh, ecological uh, environment. The, um, there at the, at the ground level or the very fundamental level, there are people focused on that we need to move into uh, a more mature or evolved state of consciousness. Then we have the environmentalists that are also uh, saying that we need to exist differently within this environment and but there's no connection or correlation in between those two and that's really where society exists right now some are saying we need to influence um, society through uh, media uh, you know to change consciousness there has been a huge expansion of people uh, exploring life purpose um, because there's a pandemic quite frankly, globally, um, that there's, a, there's a, a disharmony between our lifestyle and what's happening with the planet causing kind of dis-ease. And now, I'm, for some reason, I'm, I'm not recalling the psychological term, um, oh, cognitive dissonance. So there's a global level of cognitive dissonance that says that we have transmuted out of balance as a as a civilization as a species with the greater uh, ecology um, so let's get into some of the frameworks the complexity that we're uh, facing today is highly complex we have specialists um, that can take a certain slice and analyze that and develop solutions the, the key part from a leadership perspective is that the primary orientation still exists on a um, problem or problematic level. We're just in the beginning throes of kind of a maturation or an evolutionary process to move further into a, a solution orientation, which is basic leadership 101. You can't focus on the problem. You need to reorient and start to develop solutions. But all of the systems that are available currently um, that we want to use for the uh, solution sets were part of the problem. So as you know, Einstein has shared with us for decades, um, you can't use the same thinking that caused the problem to develop the solution. So that's really what the design center is about. Is there a new way that we can think and develop solutions um, that doesn't currently exist. So we know that human cognitive capacity is limited. We can only remember so much. Uh, we have kind of an infinite uh, level of innovation that we can access, uh, imagination, uh, creation, and so on. But to try and correlate all of those different systems is where advanced technology can really become a tool uh, to help our cognitive processing. The next level that's a critical dynamic that we need to address is what is our time frame to develop and actually implement solutions. I, the, the you know, global organizations like the United Nations and other uh, entities, 
um, that have an orientation around solving these problems um, have been an analysis paralysis. The, the, we've known that we've had these problems for eons. I mean, you can go back a hundred years and um, there's been people calling out that we're uh, headed toward a very dangerous or in a very dangerous trajectory. And yet nothing has been truly implemented. There has been innovation in small slices, new forms of energy production, new forms of water management systems, new forms of uh, health and wellness systems, but those have not been integrated into any type of a platform. And I refer to that platform as, the, uh, as an operating system, because as we know, operating systems uh, function at multiple levels. So at the user interface level, through uh, other, all the other you know, operating system um, integration types of levels. So that's uh, typically why I refer to it as a new operating system for humanity. All of the sciences, whether you're looking at um, environmental sciences or uh, complex systems analysts, um, are all saying that we are within a, an event uh, horizon that literally uh, was kicked off uh, from an awareness standpoint uh, in 2020 with the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, the data is all showing us that we have about 10 to 20 years to start to implement and I say implement, not design, but get to implementation to start to shift the system um, uh, if we are not going to uh, just, you know, hurl into a reactive mode. And we've already witnessed through extreme weather events that uh, we are not very good at reacting, whether that's, you know, hurricanes on coastal areas, uh, pandemics, I mean, we're still uh, dealing with that and then start to add flooding and drought uh, and then the migration that uh, uh, accumulates after those types of events. Um, so I think we are in a key event horizon um, to start to begin to implement and seed these new systems. One of the other dynamics around this time frame is the uh, global oriented organizations like the United Nations, the problem is so complex and so uh, diverse. When you look at it from a global scale, they finally realized that there are one, that there are correlations between the sustainable development goals, which I thought was quite silly as a systems analyst and designer. But the, the other piece is, is that we need to uh, drill down uh, solution and design orientations into bite sizes around the, si the, the scale of what they're calling bio regions, because there's different materials, climate dynamics are different, cultural dynamics are different in a bio regional area. Um, so that is uh, key. Validation that the analysis has been going on uh, for decades. Um, this data shows from an industrial ecologist that is a current um, consultant at KPMG. She basically used empirical data to validate MIT's 1972 limits to growth uh, models that basically calculated that uh, civilization will begin to collapse. And coincidentally, right around 2020 uh, is when they're showing uh, the degradation. So from that, concept, I've been using a biomimicry uh, model, and the, the model is metamorphosis. So far, uh, humanity has effectively been parasitic on the planet, creating, consuming everything in our, uh, in our path, and leaving a wake of pollutions, a, a, a broad variety of pollutions. And we're just getting, you know, we're getting larger as a, as a population, and we're we're getting fatter in the amount of uh, consumables uh, that we that we process. 2020 was kind of the beginning of this event horizon. That is a metamorphic process where we're now we're in the chrysalis period. And that chrysalis period is when most of the systems, so the systems of the caterpillar goes inside of the chrysalis and they break down. So the caterpillar ultimately ends up uh, turning into a goo and the imaginal cells, like the people that are uh, joining us today, I refer to all of you as imaginal cells, 
because you're looking at how can we rebuild or design or create new systems. The imaginal cells existed in the caterpillar while it was consuming everything, um, kind of in a participatory, participatory state, but realized that, oh, this is not the end game here. Um, so now we're in this event horizon or the chrysalis period where the systems, every system I can, I've come across, healthcare systems, financial systems, um, educational systems, um, multiple business systems, energy production systems are all in a, a down cycle uh, of what I'm predominantly referring to as a decomposition uh, state. So the imaginal cells have the responsibility to reorganize all of those different uh, ingredients uh, into what will become the butterfly, which is a regenerative creature that pollinates and uh, cycles life and is a proponent of and a, a contributor to the continuation of life. Um, this, I have spanned the, the arts and creatives um, because, you know, going back to the, even the tone, the term of a keynote, a keynote music, sound, uh, humans respond uh, dramatically uh, to sound. It can elevate our mood. It can change our orientation. Um, this is an artistic uh, representation of our neurology. Um, so the lights change just like neurons fire uh, in our brains. So it's the every community, the imaginal cells exist in every single discipline that exists within society. So we have the ability and the knowledge to how can we use technology as an integration between a carbon-based life form and uh, silicon-based uh, technologies. So what do we need to do? Um, this is my concept. I'm uh, very interested to get your all of your feedback uh, on this. Um, we are kind of at a stopgap globally in the decision-making process because of complexity. Um, I have uh, spoken with city council members, government representatives, uh, technologists across the board, and there's an inability to integrate all of these complex systems to make comprehensive and coherent decisions on how to implement. Um, and that means that there's a stopgap in where, where and how money is being spent. So the, the uh, United, uh, European Union is digitizing um, and creating a digital twin of the planet. And there are other satellite oriented organizations that are doing the same. Um, the key of a new uh, expert decision system is a simulator. We've been using and creating simulators for decades for astronauts, pilots, race car drivers, uh, now in the gaming industry, um, it, it, we're using sensory feedback loops uh, to um, develop solutions. Um, so what I'm proposing with the Atlas Biospheric Design Center is we use a simulator type of platform to simulate the operations of a city or community or urban center. Um, and that is going on in its kind of uh, early stages where they're creating digital twins of different cities. Um, but we really need to create kind of a, um, a high powered uh, design center that can do that dynamically. And what I mean by dynamically is we can analyze, let's say the town that I'm existing in, in Sayulita, Mexico, um, we can drill that down, um, look at the climate data and environmental data from uh, satellite technologies as sensor as sensory data and drill that all the way down and start to integrate um, the local physical environment as well as the local cultural uh, environment, um, which is currently being used more for social engineering um, toward consumerism, where we can use those same data streams uh, and technologies for uh, some, something more uh, benevolent. Um, as an example of these technologies already in existence, the organization of CERN, um, has an artificial intelligence or machine learning um, platform for defense systems or defense services. And what it does is it accumulates all of these different kinds of uh, weaponized defense resources. 
At the same time, it, it has a, a database and um, kind of a resource library of all of these uh, military defense mechanisms. It's also analyzing threats um, and then dynamically appropriating or allocating that weaponry toward those threats. Well, if we were to take that same type of platform, and by the way, CERN has some interest in participating in this process um, uh, through some of my colleagues in Europe um, to kind of retool or re-tune um, that application to where the threats would be climate related threats, economic threats, um, and then allocate the, a resource library of solution sets for energy production, food production, um, materials to be used for building and construction, different modes of transportation that should be implemented. So similar to the CERN current application for de defense applications, um, it can be uh, retooled for uh, design purposes to uh, enable local communities to uh, implement um, regenerative types of systems. The process and framework of this platform, um, like uh, Prince Charles of Wales, uh, is his number one priority of the top 10 is the development of a platform. Um, the Atlas Biospheric Design Center is a platform that utilizes artificial intelligence um, as a tool. So there are three main phases to the center. The first phase of the center is to identify bioregional or what the United Nations Climate Commission is referring to as radical collaborations. So at a bioregional collaboration or what other areas in the world are calling impact ecologies. That means you know, leaders and representatives from businesses, government, um, environmental, academic, um, are come together to kind of create a collective intelligence resource pool. Um, this is also going to require uh, advanced technologies for collaborations like distributed autonomous organization, distributed ledger types of technologies and the like. The next phase is the systems analysis where we um, identify all the different data streams that are necessary um, to, to begin to analyze and identify correlations and do data visualization uh, of all of those different systems, including systems like data streams for the energy systems that currently exist, uh, water management systems, transport, uh, food production, and so on. And then begin to twin those uh, uh, systems so they can be put into a simulation. Then the third phase is a production of a simulator. Um, and I can, I'll show you an example of what that uh, might look like uh, for a port city um, that has the ability to do projections into the future. We need to be able to do future forward projections, not just analyze where we are present day. Um, so that's really the function uh, and creation of the simulator. And that simulator um, does not only uh, community um, design or urban design, it also has a, a connection with the stakeholder uh, community which is the, what I refer to as the commons. So we need a user interface and I'll show you how that will, that will work. And I've been working with uh, a number of uh, what I'll call former uh, game developers and they're creating, um, the, they're at the avatar level uh, of creation to where we have what, uh, what we could call a personalized uh, artificial intelligent avatar. And um, for those of you who are familiar with the movie Iron Man, um, Tony Stark, which is kind of interesting, especially since we have a CERN uh, reference here. Um, Tony Stark uh, in his storyline was a weapons developer. Uh, and then he had an epiphany. He had a, he, he became woke through a trauma. Um, and he has an artificial intelligence uh, system by the name of Jarvis. And Jarvis is constantly monitoring Tony Stark's biometrics and then he is also his portal and interface to everything that's connected to the internet. And we have a, a global issue of data dignity um, and the, the structures that we have around the ICT environment or information communications and technologies uh, industry is all centralized. And all of these models, uh, bioregional 
regenerative models are all distributed models. So architecturally, from a system standpoint, even how we produce energy, it's centralized and then have distribution. What we need to do is we need to invert that um, for uh, to be successful for uh, providing resilience uh, as well as regeneration. Um, think about even just like the materials we would use for building are going to be bioregionally based. Um, you know, we can use bamboo in some areas. We might use concrete in other areas, and, and so on. So think about the the just the game of solitaire. The game of solitaire for at our current cognitive capacity um, with the rules of the game, the dynamics of the game, um, the, it, the, the puzzle should be solved. The solution should be uh, created 80% of the time. But yet with our current capabilities, we really only win an average of 43% of the time. However, if you run those dynamics as they're laid out uh, through a simulator, the odds of creating a viable solution goes up exponentially. So that's where you know uh, simulators are kind of a key uh, solution set for us to progress forward in a uh, much more uh, benevolent manner. Here are some of the organizations that are already underway that have acknowledged and recognized that the uh, simulators uh, and these are organizations like Forum for the Futures to the United Nations Digital Ecology Initiative. Um, it's across the board. They've all come together and said, we need to use technology um, as an augmentation for a cognitive process for solution development. So the Biodiversities, uh, Biodiverse Cities Initiative is one of those. The European Commission uh, on Design Framework uses spatial simulators as the fundamental um, component of their system and even the G20 infrastructure plan, uh, which I'm um, involved with through the Pivot Projects organization uh, also agrees. The, this next, uh, I'll, I'm gonna stop share and switch to another screen. I'll show you a simulation of what that city simulation could look like and some of the key aspects um, to this demonstration type of simulator uh, is that you'll notice on the top left of the screen you go future forward you can look at how things are today but you can them away into the future um, the other thing that's a key component of this is you'll notice that there's a stakeholder feedback loop built into this system so for example we have the um the, the UPC codes now, um, when you go to a restaurant, right, post COVID. So we've eliminated the need for menus for the most part, but the persons, you, they're kind of dependent on people having their digital device to translate their, uh, their menu um, versus having something that's laminated and, you know, whatever. So the, we need these real-time feedback loops. So businesses and industries are already migrating in that direction as was illustrated in the humanification uh, video. So let me share this uh, a sample of this simulation and then I'm pretty much a wrap. Um, we can move to questions. Can everybody see that? Give me a thumbs up. Okay, here we go.
All right. And how are we doing on time, Sam? Uh, yeah, probably got a few minutes. Okay, I have a couple more slides and then we can transition. So this is the basic um, architecture or ecology of the, um, the Atlas Biospheric Design Center. So we have all these different data streams, right? Whether it's like social networking kinds of things, uh, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, you know, Instagram, whatever. We have physical data that we can collect through uh, various kinds of scanning uh, methodologies, whether it's drone technology or satellite technology. We have geologic information that's already, you know, using you know environmental and climate um, related data uh, from governments. Uh, financial data, which would be uh, really interesting um, because there uh, apparently is a gap between where the money is and where projects need to be implemented. And in fact, in the field of impact uh, investments, um, that is a major issue. Uh, they want to, you know, uh, even the uh, insurance industry is now doing uh, requiring risk assessments, climate risk assessments before they invest in particular areas or provide insurance in particular areas, uh, economic uh, tracking data and, um, you know, dot, 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 you, you name it, uh, different kinds of data streams that we might need uh, to analyze. Um, this is an existing AI um, called Spark Beyond. Uh, we've been working with them through the Pivot Projects organization, and it has the computational uh, capacity and capability to identify correlations. Um, obviously, there needs to be um, expertise uh, running the uh, the system um, to uh, you know build these correlations. Like you know how does how is water related to the amount of food production, or you know uh, identify those patterns uh, in which we can extract the patterns from for uh, coherent design processes. Um, then we create the all of the elements for the simulation um, so we can design from that simulation and, and this is not an uncommon process um, and then create the spatial uh, rendering um, and that is a one of the most powerful um, communication and um, influential methodologies to, for so people can experience what that uh, what their future environment might look like, uh, as well as uh, gaining their feedback uh, real time. And then I can't see the other side of it because of the images. Let me see if I can move everybody down to the bottom. There we go. Um, and then we have through the um, Ecological Sequestration Trust, um, they have a technology that can digitize the different uh, infrastructure systems called Resilience IO. Um, and then, uh, and so we can do like resource engineering, like what's happening like with power production, um, it, kind of the green building uh, types of uh, systems and methodologies. And then there is another uh, more specific uh, AI tool that I've been collaborating with out of Australia, and that is called Sentient Hubs. Um, and it's had, you know, millions of dollars of research uh, applied to it. And it has the ability for businesses and um, kind of the more of a micro level uh, simulation, uh, you know, future forward type of capabilities for businesses to uh, utilize to say, how can we change the operations of our business or this particular system um, and analyze uh, the effects. Uh, and then the simulation itself is really a master planning type of platform that we can give to those local uh, communities, urban centers, uh, bioregional uh, governments, uh, and, uh, and the entities that exist within that. And at the same time, we can provide that the, the center would provide them a user interface that would be culturally appropriate um, to gain that feedback loop. So the user interface, and that's also the, the edge-based AI is correlating all of the apps that we now have on our phone for transportation you know where you know where we should buy our groceries are they sourcing their materials from you know regenerative agricultural sources 
what's the best uh, mode of transport to get from A to B. You know, we see all of these elements like the electric scooters, more bicycling, um, you know, uh, more tr uh, train type of transport to get less, you know, to reduce the amount of cars that are on the road, which causes the congestion in the urban centers and so on. The, uh, I'm gonna jump uh, one ahead and this is my last screen. This image really represents the center um, in, in its function. So we have all of the different sectors and silos and believe me, they're still not talking to one another. Transport is not talking to water, is not talking to waste, is not talking to energy, is not talking to you know, government, blah, blah, blah. So we're taking their data streams, um, kind of forming these correlations uh, with them our orientation is about the convergence uh, and uh, identifying those patterns so we can develop a critical path that's oriented toward a regenerative and healthy um, kind of a consciousness level standpoint where we're um, stimulating empathy toward the respect and regard for life systems in general. If we had that, that would elevate respect for what you know human to human male to female all of the other you know, social dynamics that we're facing right now um as well as a higher regard for environmental systems um all the way down to um, biodiversity in the soil which are uh, fossil fuel based um products uh, are killing the biodiversity in the soil, and we're wondering why our uh, immune systems have been compromised, hence the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, and then it would really enable the creation of a new operating system, and that may span all the way to uh, DAO or distributed autonomous organizational types of governance models, as well as cryptocurrencies um, distributed ledger types of technologies for currency exchange. Um, a lot of the studies so far have proven that if you localize money and money exchange, it is an economic stimulator. So that being said, uh, that's a wrap for me. Um, we can move into questions or the panel discussion, whatever works best for the group. Hey, Paul. Uh, thank you so much for that. It was absolutely brilliant. Uh, really thought-provoking talk. Um, uh, yes, some really, really important kind of questions and, and warnings about the state that humanity's headed um, uh, and, and some really worthy kind of solutions and a really nice interconnected approach to solving them. Um, if, if we could all show our appreciation for Paul in the, in the chat, that would be brilliant, everyone. Um, I, I think if it's okay with you, Paul, we'll, we'll jump into the into the panel section now, and we'll, we'll give the panelists uh, a, a chance to come back on some of what you've said, if that's okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, without further ado, I think I will introduce the the brilliant Richard Foster Fletcher uh, to uh, introduce our panelists and, and kick off the panel discussion section. Uh, there he is. Thank you so much. Uh, Paul, and thank you very much from me as well. Uh, we've spoken numerous times and the, the fog, the haze clears a little bit more each time you speak. It's wonderful to experience as I see this vision. Um, and Sam, thank you so much for hosting. If I could ask somebody with co-hosts to add the various panelists onto the screen while I uh, just thank Paul again. Uh, and Paul, a quick question while we do that and get the panel on screen and, and find out who they are. What, where do you think this this started in the beginning because we created technologies, whether that was wheels or walls or fires or iPhones. And I think we probably realized that we could use this technology to separate ourselves from nature, completely detach ourselves entirely. Is that a safety thing? I mean, why did we want to do that in the first place, do you think? Yeah, I, I think the majority of our thought processes were um, oriented or founded from fear, you know, overcoming threats. Um, in fact, we still, we're still dealing with that. Um, the social psychologists are, are hopeful that we'll mature 
and uh, you know, you, from you know the depression and anxiety and insomnia and you know the cognitive dissonance that I mentioned, um, we have the psychological and physiological uh, problems uh, that we're facing right now, and they're escalating. I mean, it shows up in road rage or it shows up in school shootings. Um, the, the, the just the dissonance is agitated and you know turns into wars and so on so you know it is a fear orientation and that's where the imaginal cells um we don't have to influence all of humanity the majority it's like a bell curve right we just need to we need to influence the early adopters that have enough influence to create or implement a new system um, that is not fear-based but however the window that i mentioned this event horizon we are headed toward and that's really the problem orientation too it's that's a fear-based it's apocalyptic it's catastrophic um there has been a loss of hope um which has really affected many of our youth um behaviorally uh, because there's no vision of hey we can actually build a, a, a great future for us. Um, there's been, you know, it's always a threat. The aliens are going to come down and, you know, consume us uh, as hamburger or, you know, whatever. It's always this negative, fear-based um, perceptual orientation in the media and so on. Um, that is changing through some of the documentaries where we need to proliferate from a, a consciousness standpoint that we we do have a potential to have a positive future. It's not going to all end badly, um, but that takes courage. Um, and, you know, and it takes the courageous uh, to step up and, um, and do things differently. Um, and I'm not seeing that in our, in our leadership. Um, I'm not seeing that in governments. They're just, and that's why initially I referred to the, you know, the recycling thing. We've been entrained that, we're good people if we help with recycling, but in actuality, the reality of it is we're not recycling. Um, and those products are not um, viable uh, in a regenerative future. So uh, I'm with you, it, it is a fear-based and, and it's okay. I mean, we're, the anthropologists that I've worked with over the years, they refer to the term as maturation. We need to mature as a species and we'll elevate out of a fear-based orientation and move into a, a courage-based orientation. Uh, Dr. David uh, Hawkins uh, wrote a book, Power Versus Force, and he's even mapped it out uh, how that looks and how we can mature through that process. And we're literally right there. It's the chrysalis period that I mentioned. Um, it'll be the imaginal cells that create that courageous solution set yes yeah there's there's more I'd, I'd love to say of course and you and i can chat for hours i'm sure you and many people can chat for hours but let's let's meet the team paul and let's connect some of the dots i'll start on my bottom right i'm not sure if that's the same for everybody and ask sal to say sal where where are you tuning in from tonight and can we have a little bit about uh, who you are and what you do if that's okay Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, hello, I am coming to you from London. It might not sound like it. I might sound a little Californian, um, but uh, I move around wherever the tech is interesting. Um, I'm a machine learning engineer by practice, focused particularly in real-time systems. So the system that you described for CERN, I literally built exactly that same kind of system for the US Air Force. If you want to talk about the complexities of doing real generative intelligence, yeah, let's do that. Um, I'd love to dive in more to some of this work. Thank you so much, Sal. We're going to have fun tonight. Ruth, you're next on my screen. Where are you tuning in from? Tell us a little bit about you. I'm not far from Sal, actually. I'm near London, but I'm originally from Brazil. So I'm a data scientist, worked with, uh, well, I started in geology, so I got a PhD in geology, and then went from mining to oil and gas to energy, environment, and our financial data. But also stopping by with a, with a, a quick stop at getting a teaching certificate. So a little bit about children 
uh, high school children. That's the most difficult one. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing some of that journey. We'll dig into that, I, I hope. Guy, great to see you. Where are you dialing in from? And tell us about you. Hi, I'm calling in from the Forest of Dean in UK. Um, so I have a PhD applying machine learning to radar data for classification. Um, and that led to work again, kind of doing algorithm development and machine learning for uh, sort of identification and classification of uh, sort of uh, compounds of chemicals using spectroscopy data. And I really do a lot with trying to apply sort of software engineering best practice with data, with data science, with machine learning in order to do those end-to-end -end things. So rather than have that bit of code that works on one bit of data and nobody else could possibly reuse. Um, so that's very much sort of my emphasis. And I also mentor students doing at studying machine learning and data science as well. Wonderful. Guy, you're very welcome. It's good to see you here. Paul Levy from the coast, I believe. Yeah, Paul Levy, actually from the UK, which I describe as a small island off the coast of everybody else. Uh, and I live in, a, live in a city by the sea called Brighton, which is a small city down the road from everybody else. Um, but it's kind of a digital city. I'm based at various universities as an academic. Um, I've also been a consultant for a long time uh, in change, really. Um, I describe myself as a technosopher. And uh, the current book, um, Two Lockdowns uh, Away from the Publisher, I'm hoping for some more to finish it off, is called Breathing Nature in a Digital World. So there's some um, overlaps with Paul, I guess, in different ways. Wonderful. Great. Uh, myself uh, hosting these kind of things, I guess. And if you, <laughs> you like the way that we do things, we're over at mkai.org. And I think most of you I probably know anyway. So <laughs> great to see all my, all my friends here. So uh, Paul, happy with your contemporaries from what you've heard? <laughs> beautiful i'm honored um it's nice to see another gray beard uh, along on the call as well the uh i do feel it, it's it's our generation's responsibility um to see these solutions so i'm i'm super glad to be here i mean just as a you know a quick side note um some of you know i just i recently relocated uh to mexico um from the U.S., I'm uh, along the Pacific Coast. Um, you know, they're dealing with you know plastic pollution. They're dealing with wastewater management issues. They're dealing with all the infrastructure issues that we're seeing you know globally uh, at different uh, scales. But the first uh, two people I met um, uh, where I'm staying, one is a uh, she is a materials scientist for uh, Nestle Mexico. And so from a business or industry standpoint, um, Nestle is interested in identifying different materials to use for packaging um, for their you know, plastic bottled water and all the other products that Nestle is involved with. The, her uh, contemporary uh, is uh, focused on um, uh, water management, um, water cleaning and um, processing. So uh, those were the first two people I met here. So it's, I, I think we're in um, it poised that there are, is expertise and knowledge and wisdom globally ready to let's implement, let's, let's move forward. And so I, I hope that this brain trust can help us figure out how to, how to move forward and make progress and you know, create some seeds, at least at a community scale uh, somewhere in the planet. I, I think once, um we have a, a proof of concept um that this works i think it will proliferate ex uh, at very rapidly um because i think cities and people are ready to to do things differently they just need to it needs to be enabled i've got a, a couple of thoughts and examples that i may share we'll see how this conversation goes i, I don't plan to be speaking much if possible um sal uh you're bringing some californian sunshine to london so we love that uh you've heard paul <laughs> quiz a talk now for uh, a little while how did this land on you is this is this your territory what's new for you here uh, what stood out for you 
Yeah. Um, so it's so many things. Uh, part, I have to thank you very much for leaning on one of my favorite metaphors, metamorphosis, looking at the cocoon. I think you missed something really crucial, though, which is that we do not know scientifically what it is at that very point, that turning point, what it is that takes something from being mush to actually re-energizing, utilizing ATP and becoming a new functioning entity. And I think it's very careful in this metaphor that you recognize that's exactly where we're at. We could be developing a way to have metrics to see the death of humanity just as much as we could be having a propelling mechanism. And we do not know the answer to that. We've never observed this before. I think second to that, what was really interesting in this talk were two things. For me, uh, it was the fact that, you know, I say this all the time. I say, if it's ML, it's in Python. If it's AI, it's on a slide deck. This was the case here, right? You've described everything that actually exists that you've described are decision trees, correlation matrices. Those are firmly ML. Those aren't AI. And then simulations as well are derivative of, they could be considered AI, but they're generative within the limitations of the confines of what you give them. They're not necessarily what you're describing, collecting their own information or developing their own ideations. I would separate that a little bit. And I think that's meaningful because at least from a scalability point of view, one of those is much harder to compute. So if you can get better answers from ML, right? You utilize that because it gets you right answers, but be honest about what it is. And then the last point is what I found really compelling about this was it was basically an introduction to sort of, you know, cognitive engineering and cognitive extension uh, and artificial intelligence from an incredibly westernized point of view. Um, and a lot of what you're describing is not a change in technology or utilization of technology. It's fundamentally a change in culture. And I can speak to this in just one way that's really interesting. My culture, I come from a Native American background, and in my language, Salagi, our pronouns are not she, he, nothing like that. Our pronouns are based on whether or not an object or a person has volition or not. So trees have volition, people can have volition in different acts. So you can be you know, angry by choice, or you can be hungry by choice and go to a buffet, or you can be, you know, brought into a state of rage, right, that you have no control over. And I think that that is a really interesting and compelling way to look at artificial intelligence and the ethical limitations on it. Um, but a lot of what you've brought here today is talking at the level of cultural change and not technological change. And I'd be really interested to identify when we're having those different conversations. Sal, thank you so much. What an expensive way to open this up and explore it even further. I'll actually ask these same questions so that we all get on the same page. So Paul Levia, I'll come to you next. You've spent some time with Paul Quasar before you've heard what Sal just said. What, how's this landing on you at the moment? So for me, um, judgment of Paul uh, and a few things. Um, Paul, I think you're talking about techno-cultural change um, and we don't know what that is and that really excites me. Um, I've wondered if you're a person of your time if you're a person ahead of your time or possibly a person ahead of our future. Um, and that's quite interesting because um, we, we need stuff faster, maybe if the climate change is uh, going to destroy us all. Just a couple of other kind of thoughts. Um, one is um, around actually the work of Edgar Schein, psychologist, around what our taken for granted assumptions are here. When we teach students at the universities, we use a fairly preposterous um, piece of theory, which is the notion of, and it's very binary, technophilic and technophobic. Um, and when you hear kind of technophobic views of AI and our future, the notion goes back to some of the science fiction books that created dystopian futures if we gave ourselves up to artificial intelligence. Technophobic is uh, people's experiences of corruption in tech, you know, uh, the big banks, the big corporations, governments being hacked, surveillance, which is very, very strong in the movie world, very, very strong in the anecdotal world. Um, universities are struggling to get funding to really put some figures around that stuff. So it's still very much in the anecdotal space, but large numbers of humans have a mistrust 
of technology. And it means that they have a mistrust of utopian visions of technology saving us. But somewhere in there as well of technophobic um, is the is a hopeful place. And I think you bring this across actually with great beauty, Paul, um, and I'm happy to use the word spiritual, which is we're being presented with a very particular vision of the development of technology uh, towards the robots are coming, a kind of benevolent view that this will all get solved. And, you know, the simulations will give us the way forward and we'll all uh, live longer and we won't have... Um, um, diseases like Alzheimer's because there'll be a chip for this and there'll be a chip for that. And that's very, very much pushed at the moment in the media and very much pushed in those that have an interest in that. And, and what worries me is I don't think your um, positive vision, even though it might look like that, is coming from the same place at all as the idea that this is some you know, big business opportunity. Uh, but the danger of creating uh, visions of the future that manifest as you know, images from second life and virtual worlds is that people confuse the two. Um, so it's kind of that side, could spend hours on that. Then of course, there's the technophilic view. It's the positive view of the world. And the problem with the technophilic view is it mixes up some of the Marvel movies and some of the science fiction movies essentially have a disgust at humanity. And so AI is going to finally um, you know, solve the problems because we created them and we are dumb and we've created complex problems that we can't solve and our brains are limited. Um, and so we have to somehow surrender. It's the submit button of Facebook, which always calls mean sub uh, surrender, even though we've all been groomed to press it every time we buy something or, or give a status message. So there's something around uh, the technophobic view that's also kind of very unhealthy. And the technophilic view um, is largely, largely, sadly, a surrender to technology at the moment. And, and I think what you bring, and you know, it's unfair to ask you to bring this in 20 minutes, is either of those two things. And it's very easy easy for us to imprint on what you do um, and it's a communication challenge for you to tell us exactly what you do bring because you're using a lot of the, the metaphors that are going to trigger technophobic and technophilic reactions to it and it's also a very increasingly atheistic world in the world of government so kind of what are essentially spiritual views uh, even the views of philosophers like Rudolf Steiner you know that actually uh, we need to become anthroposophical. We need to kind of bring a wisdom to this. We need to uh, wake up. We need to learn into it um, and so on um, is kind of, you know, it's just unresolved at the moment. And there's always going to be bother and trouble uh, around that. Um, and I think your view then is to go with the optimists. But I think you have to go through the, um, the, the pessimists, um, actually, because humanity is a family of diverse views. The, the last thing I want to say, which is perhaps the most preposterous one, um, and I can only say it because I'm a, a philosopher and it's coming back to Sal's comment too, that great quote that if it's machine learning, it's on Python, if it's AI, you know, it's on uh, PowerPoint, is um, my view about it is if it's AI, it'll be on musical sheets of notes. Um, and we are going to come to a place where the limitation of binary language as we hit the world of quantum computing and even go past that is that the metaphors paul that you brought the metaphors in the chat that people were responding positively to but also saying yes but were largely musical i think you're talking about orchestration and i think when we get beyond the kind of traditional male version of music about being a conductor who's usually a male uh, person we get to other kinds of music we get to jazz which has been invoked in ai coding before as a metaphor we're going to come to a place of uh, where we realize the language is going to be more like music you've talked about harmony for example you've talked about togetherness there's some metaphors there that are not easily resolved in binary coding and binary coding will take us a long way but i don't think it will take us to the vision you're talking about and it may be that quantum computing, where two things can be true at the same time, you know, and we get into that mad stuff and improvisation and jazz will take us there. But I think your vision will fall down if it relies on the current metaphors around coding. The last thing I just wanted to say is a memory at the Josef Stefan Institute, a great AI research institute in Slovenia, where I found myself as the completely ignorant philosopher uh, amongst a lot of professors who were coding their, their pants off. 
that they were up for this conversation is that I asked them the question of if a spaceship reached an asteroid belt that was displaying chaotic properties, so it was deemed to be impossible to cross at the speed that all the asteroids were going everywhere, how what might we fly across? And we brainstormed together, and one of the things we said is, we'd need to find the world's best um, improvised dancers. Um, and, and actually two dancers who had danced to the place of everyone was just taking in a sharp intake of breath that they'd never seen dance like this. We'd have to take the quality of their rapport and turn it and transpose it into algorithms that would then be transposed into the ship's navigational system. And it's at that point, I'm still convinced that music is the language that will inspire your vision, but also realize it. Well, thank you. It doesn't take much Google searching for images to look at smart city or city of the future and see that most volunteers who are arting this is taller, faster, more neon lights. And that's certainly not what we're describing. Uh, Ruth, how do we find you this evening? Well, first thing is just to agree with everything that Sal said about machine learning. And uh, having worked in environmental data and, uh, and looking at weather and all that, it's, it, it makes me feel like, wow, I want to be part of this. I want to be in one of these sci-fi uh, movie sceneries of the future, but I can't see that happening now. And brings me to mind issues uh, with simulation itself. It's just like, we are not there. And if these kind of simulations are going to end up leading to governmental policies and discussions, but uh, I, I can't see how at this point we are able to create a proper definition and representation of the systems. And the thing with, with machine learning these days, it's not only it's, it's two sides of a coin, it's amazing how widespread and accessible it is. Anyone can get Python on a Raspberry Pi or, on a, or, or online. And, it, and it, it, you can download libraries and get a mach any machine learning system going on in a few lines of code. So there's a lot of um, potential to do things easy, which of course is not going to be a case, but there's a lot of uh, potential for results not uh, come out brilliant or glittery and how can we be sure that they are representative of of what we want to discuss but having said that uh, i liked when you opened up uh, uh, talking about uh, the way that we started increasing our cognition with sound listening to people but i i want to bring it a step back this is this got so much semblance with books. I think that this is the same as, as books because they became a, deposit, a repository for knowledge in, in, many, in many ways. Uh, so you talk about going and checking on your phone and going and looking at Google for, for information. Well, I don't need to learn my grandmother's recipes anymore because I will look at, at a cookbook. Or, even, or I might not even need to have known my grandmother and have had time with her. I'll go and look at Gordon Ramsay's book. So uh, if glasses like this make me a cyborg already, all this idea about improving uh, human cognition and improving our capacity and being able to borrow someone else's brains, even across time and space, you think about that if you're reading old books or leaving notes from yourself to people in the future. We've proven it works and it has improved lives and sa saved lives. So I, uh, so I see some to, to take the musical insp uh, inspiration from Paul Levy. I see the notes of the book and, and press revolution on, on what you've been talking about. Ruth, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Guy. Great to see you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, having me. Um, so I listened to all that with, with interest. I ended up sort of wondering what was really the key takeaway 
from this you know if i was to sort of step in a lift with paul and we were going up a couple of floors uh you know what would he sort of in that time be able to say this is the problem and this is what sort of the, the solution is so what i got away from that is um i sort of picked up on you know the, the, the smart living the smart cities the integration side of things um which all sounds very good that kind of jibed a bit, echoed a bit, resonated with I think what Sal said about cultural change, because there's an element there that then makes me think if you've got some really nice sort of smart integrated city, that's you that's really got to be integrated and smart for a particular culture. You know, it would be hard to imagine that you could integrate that you'd have a smart city that really worked for all cultures. Um, I also very much agree with the, the sentiment of sort of ML versus AI. It's all very tempting to think that AI is some sort of magical guiding algorithm uh, or system that will lead us towards sort of uh, the, the, the promised land or nirvana. And this maybe then sort of picks up back to the idea of the chrysalis. So chrysalis, so pupation, the idea of life persisting. Mother Nature has come up with some really weird and wacky uh, ways of life propagating itself. You know, hey, you're going to go into a cocoon, your cells are going to become a soup, and then you're going to emerge as something totally different. Um, and so, um, uh, as Sal said, and other people have said, you know, machine learning is one thing. Y decision trees, well, random forest, or you know, whatever your algorithm of choice is, you've got, you know, we're talking about supervised techniques here. So you've said, here's a bunch of input data. That is the desired response. That is what I want you to be able to predict with this input data if we now think well let's call that ai let's apply that to the future of humanity what are we going to train that ai to do what's it going to try and you know bring about for us and i think if we know if we really knew what that end goal was of what we wanted ai to take the inputs for and produce why do we need the ai surely we could do that ourselves and if it's a case that we say okay we're going to take the natural uh, we're going to be inspired by mother nature and we're going to take uh, essentially simple patterns because really life came about didn't it from chemicals that ended up you know a bunch of chemical reactions that found that they could combine occur in a certain way and they reproduced and that became life because that reproduction success bred success. So do we say, OK, our AI future is that we are going to encode these micro building blocks and that is going to build a new world for us. And we will, you know, we will put the right building blocks in place, just like Mother Nature did. That success will breed success and that will lead us towards this AI future but then who gets to choose what those simple building block rules are and how what would we end up with would anybody have any confidence in that because we would have no idea what we were setting ourselves up for uh, you're describing both a technological and a communicative challenge that go hand in hand. And Sal, I saw you nodding a few times and, and then also, I think your hand just went up, which <laughs> you don't need to raise sorry, your but hand. But... Yeah, I think there's, I mean, there's, I think there's a gap here um, of, right, there's supervised and unsupervised learning. Yes, right? There's like, hey, look, this is my idea of blue and this is my idea of red. Can you learn that? Or, hey, machine, unsupervised, can you tell me what the difference between red and blue is? Great. But then everyone forgets about the third one, reinforcement learning agents where I specifically say I am going to optimize around solving 
a problem domain without giving any evidence for the way to approach that problem within that environment. You create your own optimality. You can put several reinforcement agents into the same space and try to solve problems. When we're describing problems, if it's done in the style, which I would hope it was with CERN, for example, you would have at the edge of that problem, something which is trying to develop in that way. Um, and if we're going to sort of take this back to a way that people who have not modeled this on supercomputers can understand, it's fundamentally different from the cognition of a centrally located cognitive mechanism, right? Everything that you've described here assumes that the right model of cognition has a spine that sensory mechanisms come out and are amplified back into by human integration and interaction with their environments. What if that's not true, right? So the systems that I build are actually cognitively modeled biologically much more closely to something like an octopus where it does micro calculations at the edges of its touching of the environment. You do little like ANOVAs at that edge at two columns and then you track that back as aggregates of decision making for should I even pursue this as a direction of information gain. It makes those decisions itself. Then when you're talking about the ethical blanket around that, it gets really interesting, but it's not this runaway nonsense that you're describing. Even in the most complex computational things that we can describe, you just put race conditions into it and you say, hey, look, if it's a standard deviation away from where it was to Tuesday, maybe a human should check in on it, right? All of these exist on the element of time. And when you put that into place and potentially with like the idea of thinking of extending embedded cognition in our environment, which is what you're describing in smart cities, what's beautiful in that is that you could have octopus cognition and have those race conditions, those moments of stepping in and thinking, hey, is this the direction we want to go? Those could be brought into quorum, democratic quorum across the city, across that localization. And that's beautiful, right? That's democratic production of societal artificial intelligence embedding. That's really interesting to me. So the minorities in an area can just go hang. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ruth, help, help us out here. What do you think? I might spend the whole day just agreeing with what Sal says, but I want to bring it to another level. It is about reinforcement learning because that's where we can leverage what machines can that, that we can. So the same way that you talk about how much memory books can record. Now, uh, now computers with genetic algorithms, uh, reinforcement learning and all of that, they can uh, explore, uh, explore solutions in uh, speed and volume of solutions uh, that, that we can't and that's fantastic. So given a certain problem, uh, it might become a matter of time for computers to find that solution. Great, thumbs up. Then the problem is, how did you define what the solution is? So we, you have all the tech, all the technology available, but who is to define what uh, what is a positive behavior to balance to, to to reward your your machine learning model? So then that's where. So that, that's not a technical issue anymore. It's a technical issue of translating that, but you might decide that um, your answer might answer your optimization problem. And you might find an amazing solution that you have not ever thought you might find a cow with a different shape and mint meal with a fantastic sh different shape that's extremely more efficient. But if you haven't set your system in a way that gives you the right answer, you might be creating uh, problems elsewhere. So that becomes not a machine learning problem anymore, but it becomes a wide society problem. It goes back to, so who defines the regulations? How do I fare? How do you define how that affair? Cultures. Who gets to spank the AI's bottom when it's bad? I'll turn it off and on again. Guys, say, say some more about this. Oh. You'll, I mean, we have to find some ways forward, don't we? Otherwise, we're going to be in dialogue forever. And, and meanwhile, business makes hay, corporations, governments make hay while this sun is shining and while we're in these debates. So what's the balance here? It does just partly tell me, and I don't mean to sound disrespectful, but when holacracy came along, the, the new way of organizing a business without hierarchy, there are lots of people saying, yes, but, you know, who's going to define the problems? You know, who's going to tell people what to do? What happens if people misbehave? And, you know, ultimately a model 
will struggle to somewhere else, which is what holacracy is doing. But we have to become aware that every taken for granted assumption we have that is in our language, particularly if what we've done so far has taken us so far, that when there's a kind of visionary image, and it's so much more than a visionary image for me, what Paul is doing, because there's substance underneath it. It's both an affirmation of the learning so far of AI, but also with a respect for the unknown. Um, you know, m metaphors like kind of a cellular collaboration between AI and humanity. Um, and, and also the notion that um, you cannot frame problems always. There's not a what's a cause, what's an effect, but there can be an orchestration and a harmony. Uh, there can be a discovery. But so just be careful when we say, who's going to spank the bottom of the um, machine learning? You know, what if the machine learning celebrates its failures? You know, and there's some great learning theory around that. So I'm, I'm happy at the moment not to impose a mindset onto the future, but to be open to the possibility that what we've currently learned will be incorporated into the future, but we don't know what we don't know. Um, and probably that's one of the keys to solving the climate crisis, because what we currently know got us here in the first place. We forgot. Um, we'll do a quick time check. It is half past six. I'm assuming Sam doesn't want me to <laughs> close this conversation at this point. But for those that do have to go, um, you've, got, uh, you've got a recording coming up. So, you know, do not fret if you've got to do things we will very much have this uh, available to us and, uh, you know, we will uh, make it available. And, um, you know, these are, these are the right conversations. These are tough conversations. They're not going to be to everybody's liking. You can see that we're, we're down one on the panel right now, but that's God, okay, right? Yeah. Well, that's okay. And that was the time up for that one. And guys made some amazing points and we're glad to have had those. Uh, Paul Q, I wonder, you mentioned DAOs earlier on, and now we are talking a little bit about automation uh, of process and decision-making. Would this be an opportune time to share a few thoughts on decentralized autonomous organizations? Um, yeah, I think I, I really liked... Uh, Sal's reference to, um, you know, an octopus or another form, uh, another life form. Um, and if, if humanity is to move toward a more collaborative, um, kind of symbiotic type of life form within the greater uh, biosphere, it's going to look different. It will be new. It's kind of, you know, referencing Paul's uh, uh, metaphor of the, you know, the, the asteroid belt. It, it is something new. My focus has been, what do we need to do at least at a preliminary level to move us in toward a different trajectory? That, that's where we're stuck. And we can analyze and have, you know, summits and COP26 conferences, and nothing will be taken forward to, to change our trajectory. So I was also intrigued by, you know, Sal and Ruth's uh, comments about the cultural differences. I've been focused, and I'll get back to DAOs, um, because how these organisms um, are, are formed will be unique uh, culturally. I've been focused over the last five years on New Zealand specifically. And the reason that, and this was post the United Nations Digital Ecology Initiative, we needed to find, we came to the conclusion, oh, we need to identify a pilot site. It's like, here's all these great ideas. Here's all these great tools, but we need to have a sample site or a pilot site identified. So it was my charge to identify that pilot site. So I needed to find a location that was receptive policy and governance wise, which New Zealand is. Um, they're part of the Wellbeing Economic Alliance, uh, which involves multiple countries, uh, Wales to Iceland. Coincidentally, all of those countries are led by women, which is another dynamic that's going on in this transition um, in, our, 
in our maturation. Um, so from a government and policy standpoint, they've even defined their national budget as the well-being budget of, of New Zealand. Secondly, there is a um, what I'll call a more indigenous culture. Um, they're not technically the indigenous culture. They were wiped out. Um, but the Maori, the Maori and the colonials are clashing right now. And, you know, in reference to Sal's uh, comment earlier, the Maori view, for example, donut economics very differently. They view uh, that we are not separate from nature. And the Western uh, culture and um, orientation that Sal commented on earlier about this model uh, it is not truly a... Uh, colonial or Western European uh, orientation. It's more of a middle way. Where is this place from individual biometric um, well-being and cultural, include cultural being environmental as well, the, the integration or from a more of a Zen perspective, a middle way? What, where is that conjoining uh, area that if we can converge these two vectors, so to speak, um, that are different, um, which, and I haven't been reading through the chats, but where, where is that kind of that intersection point to where we can actually move forward instead of just creating a stalemate um, or echo cancellation type of process where one energy cancels the next and um, you, know, you obliterate one another, which has been our pattern so far um, predominantly anyway. Right, you don't you don't agree with what I like. I'm going to take you out if I can. If you don't, and, and if, if I can't, you'll end up taking me out. But we need to find this kind of harmonic um, solution set um, to to move forward. The the DAOs are a, an example of a, a system architecture that is more organic in its function versus hierarchical and mechanical, which has been the predominant kind of structural framework that we've been looking at. And that has not worked, you know, as results. And then as far as like the metrics for the, the machine learning, I think if it's life supporting, um, that could be a fundamental algorithmic, is this supporting of life? And by the way, that includes that in life cycles, there is decomposition components and, and uh, aspects to that dynamics. So there's decomposition, which could address the kind of the degeneration or decomposition of many of the systems that we have. Um, and then there's the generation uh, and regeneration of other parts. I mean, that is the life cycle. It's continuing generating and degenerating. Um, so we need to embrace that. Um, and I think that, quite frankly, the references from a consciousness level um, in the social scientists and the you know, global organizations, they keep referring to um, indigenous wisdom. Well, that indigenous wisdom, the common denominator in indigenous wisdom is um, integration, entanglement. We, we are part of the, the whole versus the separateness, which is predominantly a Western um, orientation, mechanistic, hierarchical, masculine you know, orientation. So it's eliminating the separation and looking more at symbiosis or the integration um, as far as algorithmic, algorithmic models. And that's showing up in the DAOs that there isn't, one person doesn't have more power than the other. It's, it's more of an integration of the whole as an entity. So, and that's what the DAOs are doing. And that's what distributed ledger technology is really doing with smart contracts and cryptocurrencies. And which I think is kind of at the root of the problem that I'm facing to make progress is because the global banking system doesn't wanna see distributed ledger technology where there's local exchanges and they can't take a portion of that. Um, you know, so th that the financial system um, is in jeopardy. Um, with the with the with the creation and implementation of this of distributed ledger uh, types of things, so uh, and then the big carriers are in threat 
um, because they can't manage all that data and skim that data for social engineering types of uh, applications. So going back to your DAO inquiry, the, this maturation process uh, is kind of going from the centralized um, organism to more of a symbiotic distributed organism that has multiple functions um, closer to the edge, but works in harmony with the greater whole, hence the reference to murmurations. Um, so uh, I hope that answers your question, Richard, and not too abstract, but I mean, it, it, this is a completely different way. We need to think completely differently about what we look like as an organism moving forward and, and harmony is, you know, getting into a, a, a more of a stasis state with the greater environment. Um, and that affects kind of all the sectors or if, you know, because we've had to silo it and we had to put names on it and labels on it. Um, but it's really about going from being noisy on the planet to being, to creating music. And beautiful music, whether you, however you want to, whatever energy expression medium you want to use for that. Mm. So, and oh. still a kind of kiss. I saw that one. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> An image of Gene Simmons' tongue. Just, <laughs> I've got a question out. if you want it, Sal, but just jump in if you'd prefer. I just one comment on that is like, I think we are at a really fascinating time for DAOs, right? Because like it's legal to incorporate with a DAO in Wyoming That's right. of all states, right? And so we're starting to see decentralized businesses and that is hitting this capitalistic layer where they have to be acknowledged and identified by other structures of engagement. Um, so it's really powerful in the next five years, we're absolutely going to see that coming through. Um, that's it. That's all I had to say on that. I, yeah. yeah, I think this decentralized technologies and climate change are really destabilizing in a very exciting way. You know, China needs a stable world, right? You're not going to get that with climate. So it's, uh, it's going to undo the, the new world order that was built over the last few decades. Uh, it was built on the sand. So it's going to, it's going to change for sure. I, I want to uh, insert another idea, Sam, shake your head if you don't want me to put new ideas in at this point, but if, if you don't, <laughs> okay. We, we talked about blockchain a little bit there. We've obviously been talking a lot about AI. This question of energy power, I mean, as in not power and control, but energy use comes up a lot. And I think there's a lot of confusion about this. There's, there's a, a science fiction idea called the Kardashev scale. Just give me a nod if you've, you've heard of the Kardashev scale. The, it goes, we're at level zero, but it's like one, two, three. And if you want to be doing like, you know, galaxy level simulations, then you're at level three, right? Because you need a whole load of power, right? Power that we can't even imagine right now. So you go and find some life in the, in the galaxy somewhere, if you ever could, and you could pretty much work out how civilized they were by how much power they're using. Now, to come back to some salient points today, like we don't seem to have had this power energy discussion before. And I, and I, I keep seeing this thread, this narrative coming through now. And I think it's very interesting to watch it happen. And I'll, I'll extend this question a little bit, and I'll, I'll give you the example of electric vehicles. Think about all the myths that you have to bust around electric vehicles. Think about all the stuff you're hearing, right? The mining of lithium. That's a real problem, is it? Or when did we ever hear that about the mining of platinum or gold? The weight of the batteries produces particulates from the tires and they're carcinogenic. When did we ever hear that about four by fours? The circular economy. When did we ever hear that about cars? So we've had all this manufacturing for years in every sense. We've had industries and Formula One and everything, and we've never had these questions, oh, what about the energy use? Now we talk about blockchain, we talk about AI, and the first thing we're hearing is, oh, but it uses too much energy. What, where's this narrative coming from, do you think? Who's got some... Ruth, what's going on with this, do you think? And do you agree with anything I just said, of course, as well? No. As a geologist, I get the lithium thing because really it's a completely different resource. And 
uh, which one, which other one did you say before? Uh, no, but the thing is, certain resources are more limited than others, and certain resources have different costs associated with that. But I'm optimistic in this way because I think this uh, some scarcity com combined with need leads to technology development, and I believe that we are inventive and ingenious enough to, to come up with, with new technologies. So the lithium thing is a problem, though they just found things in, in Cornwall here that's expected, but but in terms of the composition of the earth, it is, it is a, a, a thing. But uh, I wanted to, to change it a little bit, but combining with what you said, I'm just looking at the famous cartoon that came out the night before the first climate summit. And for people who haven't seen it, it's, it was just before the climate summit. So the cartoon is uh, in the middle of the conference, there's a big PowerPoint saying energy independence, preserve rainforest, sustainability, green jobs, livable cities, renewables, clean water and air, health children. And someone stands up and says, what if it's a big hoax and we are creating a better world for nothing? I just love that because I have my ideas about uh, economy. I have my ideas about geology and mining and all that. In a way, I don't care to a certain point because I'd like to see what Paul's suggesting. I'd like to see it, it becoming reality. Why? Because I want clean energy. I want healthier children. I don't necessarily need to have the same beliefs or fears as you men mentioned before for that. So. Uh, why wouldn't I want to put my efforts in creating a better world, whether he's right or, 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 I, or I'm right? So it doesn't matter for me if lithium is going to is, is, is such a uh, scarce resource or not. Because as I was growing up in university, oil was always a scarce resource, but they always found another for another another fifty years. So to a certain point, it just becomes a discussion that keeps on going, keeps on going. I don't care. Can we improve machine learning? Can we improve the understanding around it? And can we make a better world? As long as it's a better world and it's definitely a better world for most of the people, just do it. Can I just come in? Because I, th I think in terms of your question too, Richard, um, maybe building a little bit on Ruth, but also noting, Paul, that you said harmonics, you mentioned music, so we're, we're kind of back there, is you know, in terms of harmony, there are some really bass notes and there are some really high notes. And sometimes in music, there's a really slow rhythm where the beat doesn't happen for about 10 bars and then you really notice it. Uh, you know, it's some really clever stuff in music. Um, but maybe we're favoring all the fast notes somewhere in the middle. It's about what's this going to achieve? When can we get a result? And, you know, machine learning is very, very good at getting quick results. You can join this stuff up like bricks in a house. But you mentioned indigenous, Paul, and I, did, I just wanted to add, add to that. I went to a conference quite a few years ago in Banff in Canada. Uh, it's a really powerful uh, thing around kind of change and, and some other big questions. And they had invited uh, an indigenous group from uh, the Aboriginal community in Australia. And there was some wonderful stuff where they met the uh, indigenous communities in, you know, displaced communities in Canada. And you know, there's kind of a lot of restitution happening, maybe a bit too late. But they were actually running a session in, with music too in Australia that I went to, uh, sorry, from Australia. And it was about deep listening. And there's a lot of stuff out there about deep listening and the Aboriginal community. There was just I mean, I'm quite um, not expert in this, but somebody just talked us through to the point where everybody who doesn't usually cry so easily were crying. And it was just telling the story of how they make a didgeridoo, you know, not one in the factory quickly automated. But it was this thing about you know how long it takes to actually choose. Uh, what's going to make up the didgeridoo and then how you bury it and it's very important where you bury it and it can take you three months to decide where you're going to bury it and you bury it under hot you know in hot earth under the sun and then you leave it and occasionally you don't ever dig it up to see how it's doing with key performance measures you just kind of listen and it can take a year or two before the moment comes to take the didgeridoo out and play it and, and someone showed us the one that had only just come out and they played it and we all burst out crying in our kind of, you know, wonderfully middle class Western way. Um, but, but anyway, the concept of deep listening was then a bit later, they told a story of how, you know, we all know what's been done to indigenous communities. They talked about the children that have been taken away, what had been done to the land. They only had very small reservations. This was the arrival, you know, um, on the ships from countries like the UK. Um, but we got to a place where there was a story, I think it was in the early part of the 20th century, where one of the elders of the indigenous community finally had their day in court. 
Uh, and this had been from the newer generations of the Aboriginal community that had gone into cities and said, we need our day in court. You know, it's about compensation and recognition. Um, but the very elderly, um, um, you know, kind of leader of the community met, the elder met the judge. And the judge who was there to, you know, encourage restitution um, said, look, there's been a couple of hundred years of this, 300 years. You've had opportunities to bring this before. You know, why are we in court so late? Why are we in court now uh, when, when so much has been done to you after all these years? And, and uh, the legendary story um, was that the elderly person who'd said nothing throughout the whole trial, not a word, simply looked at the judge and said, because we're still listening to you. And, and you know, the whole con concept of the workshops of listening can take hundreds of years. Those base notes come in, you can forget that they're there. And whilst we might find that traditional machine learning and AI can absolutely help to build the, the future that Paul is talking to, you're using words like harmonics because there's going to be an AI that we haven't imagined. And there's going to be developments in human culture that we haven't imagined that we can maybe influence that will bring this about. And we are imposing a mindset now that absolutely can't build it, bring it about, because we are just saying that 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 will never fly. That there's only a market for maybe five computers to quote IBM. This this is a necessary future um, that we make a lot of mistakes if we just simply take the music of today and assume that's the music we're going to be playing in a while. And that mindset can actually prevent this coming about because we become technophobic about the future we haven't imagined, and we try to impose our mediocrity on the not yet revealed. That, that's a great, you know, I love your reference to the didgeridoo. Um, I will share that I had a uh, profound uh, experience um, catalyzed by the didgeridoo um, during uh, uh, an indigenous uh, rite of passage ceremony. Um, in an altered or expanded state of consciousness. And I think an important note to add to what you were saying, Paul, is the aboriginals um, that use the didgeridoo feel and believe that the didgeridoo is, creates the sound of creation. And um, it's kind of a, it's a base note for creation. And it's kind of like a, um, what I'll refer to as a neurological wetware uh, upgrade, um, because it's it's like a reset. And those of you that are familiar with kind of on the hardware side of things, when we do firmware upgrades, um, we just write over the, the previous pattern um, for that. And I think uh, I'm fascinated by sound and its effects on our neurology. Um, I th think your your introduction of that uh, is is quite uh, relevant in this. And if you take that to the AI level of affecting, um, you know, cultural influence, state of mind, things like that, the the biometric sensors um, that we already have in existence today, you know, they provide feedback loops of information. It's like, oh, you know, your your heart rate variability is this. Therefore, you know, oxygenate your system or you're in a, a, an incoherent state neurologically, you need to, you know, get into a coherent state, you know, do some yoga or do a breathing exercise, you know, which is all a biological um, process. The other influence that's underway with um, platforms like Pandora, Spotify, uh, SoundCloud, and things like that is you could analyze the the biological state of an individual and the feedback loop could be music to alter that state so they don't uh, get locked into a 12 and a half hour half-life of cortisol production which will completely change their mental orientation and their physical condition and stop their ability for their body to regenerate um, because when you're in a cortisol induced state your body doesn't re regenerate so the music piece is is one sliver uh, of you know of this new architectural design that would be relative to you know cultural um, you know different kinds of music for different cultures 
Um, but the one thing that music has done, um, whether you're talking about, you know, indigenous ceremonial practices, right, of passage types of things, to contemporary raves uh, where there's MDMA used, um, it brings people together. It, it's a, it's, it's kind of like a, a base frequency that brings people into a coherent state with one another. Um, so there's the, I, I think he's a Brit. Um, his name is Eric Prids. Um, he does these amazing concerts where he's using uh, spatial um, holograms the, uh, during the concert. And it's, it's an EDM electronic uh, digital music uh, platform. And he's conveying images. It's called hollow. And I think it was done in, uh, in England um, where there's an image of, a, of an astronaut. And then there's an image of a whale. And so there, it's, it's integrated but it's all looking at different kinds of life forms, um, you know? And uh, so I, I know that's a bit tangential, but um, it is, it's creating a new frequency for our operating system uh, and how we exist within the, the biosphere, how we transition energy, different forms of energy, how we communicate <laughs> with one another. It's all different forms of energy. So, um, but it's obviously not new, right? Didgeridoos have been created for thousands of years. And it's a little yes. dystopic to me that we would need a technological intervention in to have our bodily homeostasis, right? That's, again, maybe a much broader discussion and differential visions of the future. But uh, technology can save the world. That, I think, is complicating it in a way that is not going to breed happiness and hope. Yeah, see, but that you're saying, you know, technology can save the world. Mm -hmm. I think if you categorize technology as a tool, mm -hmm. then it's, it's us, you know, we're empowered to do that. We're just using a different kind of tool. And specifically to the didgeridoo in those types of ceremonies, there's another dynamic that's usually going on there with using an energy form that we don't quite, we can't, cognition, but we can accept uh, through the wisdom traditions is there are people that are there that are just holding the space. They're, they're sitters. And can we translate the musician and that person empathing, you know, uh, empathizing with that community to play the didgeridoo? Can we digitize that? I don't know. But the thing that but the technology, what the technology can do is that we can scale it. Because if we try and have rite of passage ceremonies in all the different cultures, we're out of time. So we, that's why I wanted to mention that time frame. We have to do something at least at a preliminary level. It's not, just, and it should be dynamic in its, in its design um, to where at least we can move forward. I mean, this, this my, that's my life purpose. Um, I, I could become, you know, a, uh, a prepper and move to Wyoming and build a, you know, build a bunker. Um, but I, that would be a loss of hope. Um, and, you know, I, I implore uh, and, and welcome the knowledge and the wisdom that this community and the community that you're building uh, Richard through uh, MKAI, um, let's just do something, let's pilot something. I mean, the first, you know, uh, test flights weren't necessarily successful, but at least it was progress and they learned from those failures. We just need to get moving. There's no movement. Um, there's like little pieces, but they are not um, designed dynamically to where it will work in other places because it can't be customized and it can't scale. So we're, excuse my language, but we're shit out of luck. So, you know, we have the next 10 to 20 years to start implementation. So I'm totally receptive from everyone. Where do we start? Um, I've been chasing the money for the last decade and, you know, been wallowing and drowning in greenwashing from philanthropy to impact investors to, you know, everyone saying, oh yeah, we, we want to do good. And, but 
show me the money. Um, you know, the center is going to take some investment and, uh, you know, that's, it, it's, it's disruptive, uh, to all the existing industries. And I think that's really the crux of why I've uh, run into the challenges that I have is the finance industry doesn't want to see this happen. The energy industry doesn't want to see this happen. The communications industry doesn't want to see this happen. I mean, other people, the commons, the all, us stakeholders, us humans and, you know, earthlings, we want to see it happen, but we can't use the existing systems. We might want to decompose, like use the money from the existing financial systems, transition that, uh, for example, like the Maori received a significant remuneration for um, treaty uh, issues when when uh, the UK and the the Maori uh, when they were colonized, so they received this huge infusion of money, and they're using that trust money for cultural centers, and they're interested in building a new system. So that's why I've been focused on New Zealand um, because they don't have the, they have a little bit of a disdain toward the colonization orientation and the solution systems. And that's underway right now. So the, the indigenous trusts may be that financial resource to ignite at least the pilot level. And New Zealand is also quite interesting environmentally because it has so many different bioregions within a very small geographic footprint. They have, you know, high altitude mountains with snow to tropical areas in two relatively small islands. Um, so they would be ideal to test, um, you know, new energy systems, new water management systems, new materials production um, that are all kind of poised to implement. We just need to have the... Yeah converging point is the the design element of is, is what one would of that community look like in Christchurch. It is one of the difficulties that perhaps the most positive step that could be taken now and address some of what Richard was talking about and the tech is there with the AI we've got is twinning and without any doubt you know in medical science twinning can lead to some massive steps forward in cancer treatment and so on but ultimately if we go to the environmental level it's currently not in an oil company or an oil industry's interest to twin to a level of accuracy where finally we see that every scenario leads to you know, more climate change. And, and it's not in the interests of uh, pharmaceutical companies to twin when we finally see that they've invented 50 drugs for you know, conditions that weren't even named five years ago to get children on medication. So is the danger that twinning, which could be rather than building the smart city, but we could at least take the steps around simulation now, is there are too many financial interests uh, where twinning is not in their interest? Is, is that a question for us to pick up in AI Leaders 3, Sam? Yeah, just, I think so. Just <laughs> before we start Hour 3, just <laughs> in case. Potentially so. I'm going gonna, gonna gonna to have to say really. thank you at this point, I think, just because just we've got to look at time a little bit. I'll start with uh, Paul Q. Uh, you've given so much tonight. You've shared so much. As the hope diminishes in some people, it must, of course, rise up in others and stay alight in those like you who keep believing. And the money will come. We know it will come because of the disruption that's happening at the moment. And the understanding around ROI, of course, will change. And, and Paul, we're with you, of course, on that journey, as I've been since the first time we have spoken uh, always. Uh, Paul Levy, thank you to you. You bring so much. You bring so much love you know, which is just incredible and these kind of things. Uh, Sal, it's been wonderful to get to know you, a new person for, for my network anyway. Uh, you've really brought your whole self tonight and brought so much to this conversation. I, I thank you and we thank you, I'm sure, for that. And of course, we thank Guy and Ruth as well, who had to drop off, um, which, you know, there are other things happening in the world. We understand that. So <laughs> it's all good. Uh, thank Jerry, Sam, Stilianos. I'll give to you in a second for coming. I'll put this up on the MKI website in the next 24 hours. You know where to look. It's just over in the archive section. You'll find it. I'm also going to put the chat up in there as well. But uh, I would just recommend just going in, just save the chat to your hard drive, and you've got it there as well. I really would look through that again a couple of times when you get a minute. 
Um, so thank you for making this possible. Thank you, everybody that's joined us and stayed around, of course. Uh, Stilianos, I'll ask you to take us home, if that's okay. Of course. I, I won't keep it long. I know we've been uh, quite long. Although I, I, I have, um, working in an environmental place, I have so much to comment on all these things, but unfortunately we are out of time. Uh, what I would like to focus is, as I said in the beginning, this is something that myself, some Terry Richards and others um, are cultivating because we did think that we're, there was a gap that existed and we wanted to formulate a community of people contributing and building the global knowledge space, if you would like. Um, we're doing this to offer. Um, if you find it this interesting, please uh, keep up with us and join um, events. And if you would like to participate even more, we're more than happy to get more help in um, future organizations on the organizing side as well, um, as well as the networks and promotions and all that stuff. Um, so yeah, we, we'd love to hear from you and thank you for the wonderful contributions that we had today. Thank you all. And thank you especially to Richard for expert moderation, as always, and facilitating such a brilliant discussion. So thank you, Richard. Cool. Wonderful. And, and thanks to all the speakers uh, as well and, and everyone that's attended. But uh, I think we should probably wrap it up there because I imagine a few of you uh, uh, are cutting it fine with your next, next bits, uh, thinking of you, Stilianos. Um, but yeah, thanks all very much, and uh, yeah, hope to see you at the next time. I'll uh, I'll see you all in a better future. Oh yes, <laughs> and go and play Prider on Spotify. <laughs> Eric Prince and Prider, just magical. <laughs> Thank me later. <laughs> <laughs> see you, folks. Bye. Bye. See ya.